certainly is a, is a very big treat to have Miguel here with us today from Chicago. I'm so grateful that he didn't he wasn't able to make his flight for whatever reason. That's awesome. So uh, so he's going to do a contribution for us today. We're going to get to hear him speak a little bit. So that's awesome. Uh, today we continue our study of the book of Acts. Amen. Uh, today we're going to jump on into Acts chapter six. And uh, I love the song that we just sang, yeah. Great Among the Nations. And uh, certainly that is what God does with our lives, is he makes us great among all the nations of the world. And, uh, and, and yet, the title of today's lesson, uh, we have a two-part lesson here, uh, entitled, A Fire from a Spark. A Fire from a Spark. As we continue our study of the book of Acts, uh, you know, chapter 1, we pose the question, if everyone in the church were just like me, what kind of church would this be? And, and that can be a sobering question, or it can be an awesome question. Uh, for all of us, it should be both. Why? Because we're all sinners. <laughs> so we all have areas of our life where we're not like Jesus. And certainly we wouldn't want anybody in the church to be like us in those ways. No. And yet that can overshadow that God made you very special. That he gave you incredible gifts, things that you can use on his behalf, and things that, yes, we want everybody in the church to be just like you in those ways. Then we saw chapter 2, the beginning of God's church, the inaugural service of God's church. That is phenomenal. I mean, we have our global leadership conferences and our jubilees and the things that we do, and we get so fired up about the couple of thousand people that we pull together from around the world. How amazing is that? And yet, if 3,000 were baptized, how many attended that inaugural service? That must have been phenomenal to see. And then chapter 3, of course, life got a little challenging because when you preach Jesus' word, you get a lot of persecution. And so the guys were overwhelmed with problems and challenges, and, and they, they really had to overcome. And we got a glimpse of the incredible life God gives us when we overcome those challenges. And then in chapter 4, they just upped their game and continued to really preach the word to the point where they were flogged and they were put into prison. And yet, even in prison, they did not, went, they did not pull back. Yeah. They kept preaching the word. The more intense the problems got, the more they preached the word. Is that not awesome? Yeah. And, and then to see all the disciples were constantly pulling together in prayer. And... and to see at the end of that chapter that God honored their prayers by just shaking the place where they were praying. Is that, would that not freak you out? Yeah. We're all holding hands and we just have an earthquake? Like, wow. You know, we have this plan to evangelize the world called the Crown of Thorns Project. And I don't think it's talked about enough. You know, we unveiled this plan in 2009. Uh, please turn the high end down on the sound system, please. I don't even need the system, so just crank it down a little bit. So we come up with this plan. We put it amongst all the leaders. We, we got advice from everybody in the movement, and we put this incredible plan together, and, and we unveiled it at our staff meeting, and we got down on our knees together, and we prayed to God to honor this plan, for it to be his plan, and to let us shift and adjust it as we found out things that were more our plan than God's. And, and then, you, you know, we... we got done praying, everybody's like, yes, that's awesome. And then a 5.4 earthquake wow. right there. And, you know, people kind of freak out when the earthquake hits. Like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And, of course, Lance Underhill from the South region, he's like the spiritual one. So he's like, it's the Lord. He's honoring our prayer. This is awesome. Wow. And, and, and yet I don't think people really realize. Next year, we'll have completed phase one of the Crown of Thorns project. Wow. Is that not incredible? <laughs> and then in chapter five, we saw how great fear brings great faith. And in chapter four, we saw how they were giving of themselves, giving to meet the need, just like our churches today. Yeah. Stretching themselves to where they gave everything they had to the point where they sold their homes, they sold their property and brought all the money from those sales to the apostles' feet. Like, that was like, wow. But then we saw Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, right. Portray, portray to everybody they were going to do that same thing, but hold back 
and saw God deal with it. And, and so that's sobering to think about God dealing with us. Yeah. And yet after people had given up everything, sold their properties and land, done all this stuff, we find ourselves in chapter 6. And the church had been growing, and yet, uh, and yet you come to find, where do we land after we like, just drain ourselves completely of everything? That's where the disciples were at. We're going to pick up in Acts, Acts chapter 6. I have three points for you today. Point number one is taken from Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. Point number one is the spark of grumbling. Point number two comes from Acts 6, verses 8 through 10, the spark of opposition. And then point number three, a spark always creates a flame. And both of those things bring the flames of great preaching. Yeah. Amen? Wow. Wow. Let's jump on in. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Oh, the Bible says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. So you come to find right here, Right after giving special missions, draining themselves of everything, they're down to nothing, they've sold their homes, their properties, Ananias and Sapphira get killed, and then the focus comes off God. And it goes back on the people. And it says that the Hellenistic Jews began complaining against the Hebraic Jews. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I've lived in California uh, for 39 years. And um, we have these things called brush fires. You ever seen one? Yeah. yeah. And they burn thousands and thousands of square miles of land every year. Yeah. And, and yet, this is actually supposed to describe how the word of God works in our lives. Wow. Come on, bro. A small spark creates a huge fire. Yeah. Now, there's a difference between being on fire for the Lord and having fires in our lives. You know what I'm saying right there? Yeah. So, so we want to go for being on fire for the Lord, not having fires in our lives from the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And yet, it is the smallest of events that starts the greatest things in our lives. You have a decision to sin or a decision to obey in a given moments in your life. You have decisions to be encouraging or to be harsh. You have the decision at different moments to hold the line for the Lord or to just kind of give on in. To keep your mouth shut and closed or to speak out the truth. Yeah, yeah, come on, bro. Yeah. To keep your mouth closed and forgive or to speak out against someone. Wow, wow. Come on, bro. You have decisions to act or to hold back. And yet, nothing great happens when you hold back. And yet human nature causes us to draw back, does it not? Yeah, yeah. Come on, Ryan. Smallest of events in our lives make the most impact. Right. Imagine what the small event of having a 15-minute prayer can do in your life. Come on. Awesome. Taking five minutes to pray on a break on a really tough day yeah. can be the moment of decision that causes you to share your faith with someone else that's hurting. I think about the small spark that caused so much in my family's life. In 1986, my Aunt Gail studied the Bible with the Boston Church of Christ and got baptized. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, my aunt was, uh, she had been suicidal. She tried to commit suicide three times. And uh, they're from, uh, my, fam my dad's family is from the Cape in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And my family helped build the bridges that went across the big canal that, that goes right through, you know, the little swirly thing mm -hmm. of land out there. Well, she tried to jump off the bridge that my grandfather built, 400 feet down, to wow. kill herself. And she survived. Wow. And so, all of a sudden, her life completely turned around. She didn't want to kill herself anymore. She was fired up. She had great friends. Everything was like, wow! And, and then a couple months after she got her life together, she was killed in a car accident. Wow. None of us ever knew. Wow. None of us ever knew what exactly happened. And most of my dad's family didn't even really know the church that she had been baptized into. And yet, um, 
gosh, I became, years later, the church historian. I went back and I had scanned all of these articles from 1980 in our movement all the way through the present day. And doggone it, if somebody didn't join our church in 2013 in DC, and as I was scanning through looking for the date of their baptism because they had been baptized in 1986. Because just like we list our baptisms, they were on the bulletins back then. As we scanned through, it said Gail Harding, Framingham, Massachusetts. That's a small town. I, I, I got to go find the records. There was only ever one Gail Harding ever in Framingham, Massachusetts. Wow. My aunt was saved. My dad always was like, I know this Kit McKean guy. It's from your church. I just don't know where I know him from. That's where he knew him from all these years. Well, lo and behold, she didn't get to really tell everybody exactly what church and all of that. But God wanted us so bad in 1989, my, my dad's cousin Marilyn studied the Bible, got baptized in the same Boston church, not knowing my aunt had been baptized. So the Lord laid it on my aunt's heart to actually reach out to my mother. Well, she was in Boston. My mom was here in Orange County. So for three years, she went after my mom, trying to get her to come out, trying to get her to come out, and finally got her to go to a woman's day in Boston. And wouldn't you know it, the guest speaker was the woman who led the Orange County region, right where we lived here in Orange County. And so my mom went and heard this great speaker. She came back, she studied the Bible, she got baptized. It's a phenomenal thing. And then, I hated the church. <laughs> when you know it. And I persecuted like crazy. I cussed people out, I chased people out of our house, I locked people out of our house, all kinds of crazy stuff. I did not like Christians at all. And yet, what can a small spark do? Mm. Now, you know, my mom finally won me over, and she gave my phone number against my will to probably 200 guys that called me all the time. And I could not believe, as much as I mistreated these guys, how they still called me. Come on. And because they knew my mom, and they wanted her to be happy. And so they took abuse from me, really to make her happy. And most of them confessed later that they didn't really think I was ever going to really become a Christian because I was so nasty. And yet, then I got baptized. I studied the Bible. I read the truth. It changed my heart. And I got baptized in 1993. But it didn't stop there. Because now my kids have been baptized. And, and my dad was baptized. And, and while my dad and my older son have struggled, they know the truth. And they're always talking about coming back. And one day they will. And yet, that little spark in 1986 yeah. set off salvation for almost my entire family. Wow. It's been an incredible thing to watch wow. how God works. <laughs> and yet, there's a different kind of spark. That we have. Mm -hmm. The Bible says right here in chapter 6, verse 1, that in those days, the number of disciples was increasing. And yet, you had the Hellenistic Jews and you had the Hebraic Jews. Well, the difference is that the Grecian Jews, the Hellenistic Jews, were born outside the Holy Land. Okay, And then the Hebraic Jews were the ones born in the Holy Land. So you can imagine what might have happened between those who were kind of like born in the church and those who were not. And it's kind of like the dynamic that you see in the religious world today, those who grow up going to church versus those who never go to church. And so that got brought into the church. And so as the number of disciples was increasing, people started looking at each other and going, well, you, were, you weren't even born here, dude. And, and that translated into taking care of others more than one person more than another. And so there began to be grumbling and complaining. And you think about the growing church. Isn't it awesome to be a part of a movement and a church that's growing constantly? Is that not an amazing thing? Yeah. You know, even in the midst of the, the Chicago team going out and the Dubai team going out, and of course they just had their inaugural service, oh, yeah. and Artie and April are doing great. April's going to be coming back this next week. 
Uh, they have a heart checkup, so she'll be in town for a little while. Uh, even with all of that happening and all the transition, and the, let me tell you, we send, our, we send the best disciples out, and the ones who are leading most, I should say, not best. We're all best in God's eyes. But we send out those who have the greater responsibilities, which means others need to step up into their role. And in, in the midst of that, you think in, just in the last eight weeks in our church right here, right, in our region, in the last eight weeks, we've had 12 people added to the church right here. Is that not awesome? I mean, we've had some incredible people baptized. I mean, we saw, we saw Bernice's sister, Kiki, baptized last week. And, uh, and I, I'm going to do it to you. I was going to do it to you. It was funny because I remember when Kiki first started coming, and I get to see everybody's faces from up here, right? So I can see who's angry. I can see who doesn't like what's being said and all that stuff from up here. And, and, uh, and Kiki came in, and she was just kind of like. <laughs> I, remember, I remember looking one day, and I, saw, I said something that I thought was a pretty good point. She was like. <laughs> but, but, then you see, but then you see whether the preacher's good or not, the, God of, the word of God gets in there. Yeah. And, and then, you know, people go from this. to watch how people's hearts transform over time. Yeah, yeah. It's an incredible thing. But yet, in a, in a year of transition, right, we've seen in 40 weeks 72 people added to this region. I mean, that's flat amazing. It's amazing to have sent out so many people, somewhere around 40 people, between Chicago, Dubai, the different regions, people transferring to different regions. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, every time there's transition, you find out who follows people and who follows God. Yeah. Because yeah. people yeah. that follow people walk away. Uh-huh. And, you know, yeah. I, this, was a, this was a big transition. I mean, Corey's six foot seven, yeah. professional basketball player, one of the most eloquent speakers on the planet. Yeah. And then you got me, old, kind of balding, oh. Hispanic looking, oh. used to play basketball. Oh. <laughs> Not very charismatic. Oh, man. Uh, uh, just very straightforward. It, it, just a different style of preaching. Yeah. And yet, you know, it's been so awesome to see so many coming back, though. Yeah. And uh, even today, we have several who are busy with us again. Oh, 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 oh. And uh, I was so encouraged. Alex Ayala called me and said, hey, I'm coming to church. I want to study the Bible. Get restored to the Lord. Oh, and so, oh, I saw Sean read somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's great to have you back. And yet, the most amazing thing to me is very few churches have can say this, that, that this is the kind of thing that's happening, yeah. is that in the 40 weeks of this year, there's been exactly 40 baptisms as of today. Is that not incredible? That God is providing with us not just weekly additions, but weekly baptisms. Yeah. People coming to the Lord. It's great to be a part of a church that's growing. It's an honor to lead all of you that you work so hard to bring people to the Lord like that. It's yeah. awesome. Come on. And yet, I, I want to guard our hearts that as the numbers of disciples is increasing, that we don't begin to complain yeah. against one Jew versus another. Because mm. we're the modern-day Jews. The Greek word that was used here for complaining is uh, gagusmas. Gagusmas. Wow. Wow. And the literal meaning of gagusmas is a murmuring. Okay, so what that means is kind of like it's kind of like when you think you're talking under your breath, but you're actually talking. <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I've done it. And so my wife never does that. <laughs> so, so, but you know what it's called? It's called growing pains. It's called growing pains, and that's what we're experiencing. We experience growing pains. And yet, um, even the first century had people that complained. How about that? And yet, why do we complain? Because the church is, because people aren't perfect. Isn't that it? We want something, we don't get it. We don't want something to happen, it happens. We don't want to do certain things, and we're called to do them by the Lord. And so we, we, it's easier to complain about people. 
than it is to really go to God and seek for his will and understand. And yet there's two reasons why that, I mean, the church is perfect. Make no mistake. I mean, you look around this room right here. I mean, this is our church, right? Yeah, yeah, awesome. This is just the region, the, the South Bend region of the whole L.A. church. But this is our church on a week-to-week basis. Yeah. And yet, when you look around, you go, my church is perfect. <laughs> Not really, huh? No. There's two reasons why the church isn't perfect in our eyes. Because it isn't. So here's, the, here's the thing we have to wrestle with. When God looks down, is the church perfect? Absolutely, because the blood of Jesus covers all of our sins, and he does not see any of it. But here's two, this is two reasons why the church is not perfect. One, because I'm in it, and two, because you're in it, and we're sinners. And so it just makes it easy. It's easy to complain because it's, because it's easy to see our, each other's flaws. And, and yet, in verse 2 here, moving on, the Bible says... So since there's this, this gagusmas happening, and, and by the way, it's the same Greek word that's used in Philippians uh, 2.14 where God says, do everything without gagusmas. Yeah, yeah. And then he also says, offer hospitality without gagusmas, without complaining. And, and so in verse 2, we see what the leadership does about it. Because, if you, because th- that's part of my job and Tracy's job is, is to take your complaints. And yet, you're not supposed to complain. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting dynamic how the Lord sets that up? But it says, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together, right? And said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Some people could take that as like they thought they were too good to wait on tables. Yeah. Yet the only way someone comes to lead God's people is if they have this heart to wait on tables. There's many, many years of doing that. And, but then there's got to be a shifting where those who have lived that way for a long time are teaching others to live that way as well. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and so it's a different type of serving that comes. And so they say, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you, right, yeah. who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit, right, fired up, right, and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's pretty awesome. So I think we, we can misunderstand roles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Tracy and my role is prayer and ministry of the word. Yeah. Yeah. That's our role. That's our job. In its entirety, that sums up what, what we are to do. And so we are to pray for all of you. We are to pray for the direction of our church we're to pray about the plans we make and, and and then we are to minister god's word so that's done like i'm doing now preaching it's done in counseling times and times of instruction and training and so that's what we are to stay focused on anything that pulls us away from that pulls us away from our primary role in the church and so we have to guard that at all costs now what did they do about the problem but see we're still charged to fix the problem right and so the way we are to fix the problem is I'm supposed to survey the church. You know, like I look around, I can see everybody's doing well, everybody's kind of not. And go, okay, well, he's fired up. Bro, I need you to fix this. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're supposed to do about the problem. And so the words here is deaconio, means serve as a deacon. So this, we're finding, was the appointing of the first deacons in the church. And they were to serve at the tables. See, every day there was a daily distribution of food for the widows and those in need. And so what happened in the serving was that one group of Jews served themselves, the ones that were like them, but didn't serve the other disciples. So that you had to put people in charge of this who were fired up for the church and who had wisdom, enough wisdom to not give in to racism. And, and racism isn't just a color thing, guys. Racism is, I like people who like sports. So I only hang around people who like sports. Ra- racism is, I want to be around just the educated people. I don't want to be around the uneducated people. 
So you know what God does with the educated people is he takes really dumb people like me who didn't really do a whole lot in education and puts them over the really, really educated people. That, that's what God does. I'm your average ordinary truck driver who would have pulled my billy club out and beat the trash out of you. And, and he said, I'm going to soften this guy's heart and make him stop hating Christians. And, you know, this guy loves to go a thousand miles an hour in his race car and bag loud stereos, and I'm going to make him uh, have to teach spirituality. How about that? That's the God that we serve. So what happens is, you know, it's interesting that nowhere in this passage does it say that they ask these men to do this. You know, that's, that's pretty interesting. There's a way that God's church works. See, when we become disciples of Jesus, we commit to give up everything and follow Jesus, right? We commit that we're going to be ready to be at all of, all of the events, that we're going to be committed, that we're going to be righteous, that we're going to be reading our Bibles, that we're going to be all in, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then God just assumes then you're ready to serve. Yeah. Wow. So there's a calling to serve. There's not an asking to serve. Right. Yeah. So that's why, like, we have kingdom kids. Like, we have our children, and I'm so grateful for the people who take care of our kids. Amen. I'm so grateful for Hector and Wendy and what they established in there. I'm so grateful for Noelle and Janice that are running it right now. And, 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 but I'm so grateful for those that are in there serving our children. Uh, you know, my son Dylan just got baptized. He's 16. He talks about the teachers that he had all his life growing up. He, some of the people that have reached out to him on Facebook were people that were his teachers as he was growing up, seeing him now get baptized. Is that not awesome? And, and, yet, and yet, I'm so grateful that we have a church where people are ready to serve, where they wouldn't say, no, I'm not going to serve for you kids. Wow. I mean, we, we just don't have a church like that. Yeah. Everyone's ready to get up and serve and, and do. And, and so people like with the serving of kids and with the serving of older women think that, oh, that's somebody else's church. And yet we have a church where everybody understands, like, wow, the Bible says if I'm going to make it to heaven, I have to receive it like a child. Mm -hmm. It helps me to be around the kids. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when somebody would say no to being in kingdom kids, it's because they need to receive the kingdom like a child because a child would never say no. You see what I mean? And, and so it's awesome to be a part of a church where we're not like that. Yeah. Everyone's ready to step up. And, and right now, you know, we have a need that I'm calling people to. Right. Every week you hear me talking about the open Bible talk leaders meeting. That we Come have. on, bro. And, um, and and there's we've sent out a lot of leaders. We had 18 Bible talks before, and now we have 12. And so and so we're at a place like this in our church, where there's less Bible talks, and they're bigger, and they're still growing, which puts more pressure on each Bible talk leader. What that can do is that can tempt people to get sad. And you get overwhelmed with all the good gooseness that goes on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when there's transition, there's complaining that happens. Always. It's just human nature. And so we've got to be those people. And I'm calling those of you who can read your Bible and pray <laughs> to come to the Bible Talk Leaders meeting. Come Amen? Yeah. Because we need more Bible Talk Leaders so that we can get back to the 18 Bible Talks that we had. Yeah. So put less pressure on each Bible Talk leader, and then your needs will get met because you stepped up and took care of one or two people. Yeah, the, the needs of others and pressure will be equally distributed in a way that will get rid of any gagusmas that might go on. Amen? Yeah. Awesome. Let's move on here in verse 5. The Bible says, This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Paramenus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed, of course, right? That's what, that's what our role is as the leaders, and laid hands on them. Now it's amazing what the Bible says happens when there's a problem and there's complaining and, there's, and, and problems get brought forth. We put forth a solution, then everybody gets happy. Look what happens in verse 7. So the word of God spread. People start talking about God instead of about each other more. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. 
Isn't that incredible? And so we've got to choose men and women who are wise and full of the Holy Spirit. I'm so grateful for the deacons that we have in our church here. I mean, I think of uh, I mean, Hector and Wendy don't directly oversee it anymore, but they're deacons in our church. And they serve and they give and they have people over to their home. And they cater and they cook and they clean and they pick up flowers and they're just always serving and giving of themselves. You've got the Garcias, who are the deacons uh, right now, in Kingdom Kids. And yet, I, I don't know that we, that we recognize all of the, the roles of, of deacon that are being filled. You've got AJ, who is a deacon, who's overseeing our sound. You're hearing my voice, and this is being recorded, and all these things are happening, and there's this incredible projector that we all kick every week and move all around. And... And, and yet, A.J. oversees all of that every week. Not just for Southland, but for the whole L.A. church as well. And so, I'm super grateful for you and all you work. A.J. goes to bed at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning all the time. Because we need to call more of you to step in and help him. And I'm so grateful Talisha stepped up and is doing the PowerPoint. That's really incredible. And, and so, uh, also... Uh, I think this is probably the most under-recognized deacon position is uh, uh, Mason is our deacon in overseeing the song leading. And so, and so um, that is a deacon position. That's actually in a lot of church a paid position to be in charge of the worship. And, and then you've got, you've got Matthew and Marlo who are deacons in charge of the chemical recovery ministry. And so you see that there are needs in the church, that there's people that have moved out, that there's areas that can be served. My question to you today is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What gift have you been given that you will offer? The challenge I want to put before each of you is don't wait for me to see that you're full of the Holy Spirit and, and grab you. My challenge to you today is recognize yourself, the incredible gifts God's given you, and come forward and offer them for service to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, what, what this makes me think of when we talk about the deacons is Matthew Lovichek. Oh, and, uh, we, I, mean, I mean, if you look at Matthew, you know, he is a true version of Mr. Incredible. I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen arms that big before. <laughs> this is a big man. And, uh, and, and yet... Uh, and yet, you know, in the Navy, his leg got damaged. He had to come out of the Navy because of it. It was damaged so well. And I, I don't know that everybody recognizes that he walks on that thing and works on it and just goes like crazy despite how damaged his leg is. And uh, he's, he's got a child that's got special medical needs, him and Marlo. And, and, you know, he just powers through it like it's nothing. And, uh, and as one with a child with special needs, I know it's not nothing. I know it's big, what he has to overcome. Uh, he serves more than most men I've ever seen in my life with far greater challenges than most men have. And, uh, and, and then he doesn't just lead the house church. He was here early this morning with the guy setting up the sound, making sure the baptismal gets done, helping out with AJ. He recognizes there needed to be help, and so he himself stepped in to help with that. And they lead our house church, and they not just lead CR here, they oversee CR worldwide. And so we're really, really blessed to have them with us. It's an interesting thing, the wisdom of the apostles in this moment. Because the Hellenistic Jews were complaining against the Hebraic Jews. And yet, if you look at all the names of the men who were chosen, um, they, were, they were the ones chosen out of the Holy Land. There, there, wasn't one of the, there wasn't a Jew that was born in the Holy Land that was chosen because of who was being looked, overlooked. So they picked people who specifically would not overlook their own people as well and gave them this duty. It was an incredible thing. And so think about things that you see happening in the church. Think about whether you'd want to complain about them or rather do something about them. Amen? Those are the sparks of grumbling. Secondly... The spark of opposition. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. See, the spark of grumbling produces a preaching and a teaching and a ministering to people. And yet, 
The Bible says that the word of God spread more rapidly. People began teaching about God far more after this problem got overcome. And so when we start teaching and preaching more, that's when the sparks of opposition come. Verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. The Bible says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Is that not incredible? Yes. If you don't have wisdom, God will give it to you when you're speaking on his behalf. Wow. Like, wow, that's phenomenal. I need that. I don't know about you. I need that. And yet, and yet right here we come to find some incredible things. It says they could not stand up against the wisdom. Right here was the freedmen, the libertines. They were likely captives that Jews brought back, uh, brought to Rome uh, by Pompey around 63 B.C., and they moved into Palestine. Then you had the Syrians and the Alexandrians. And we learn in Acts 18 that Apollos was actually from Alexandria. That's why he was so learned. Then you have Sicilia and Asia, which is Tarsus, which is the hometown of Paul in Sicilia, probably where he came from. So these men love to do, engage in formal debates. And so as Stephen is go out there and he's performing great wonders, what happens? All the really smart people start going after wanting to have their formal debates with him. And so, of course, the Bible makes no mistake. Stephen was not that learned. And yet, look what happens. The man who is working for the Lord, doing great miracles for the Lord, will always outthink and have more wisdom than the smartest people on the planet. Because God gives him wisdom to do so. And so, it actually says, the, the Greek word here is, Suzatio, which means a formal debate, which means Stephen engaged in a formal debate with these guys. And so just like your average ordinary guys from Acts 4, Peter and John, we see Stephen as well, an average ordinary guy, not just get up and preach, but the Bible says here, he engaged in one of their formal debates. He said, I'm coming in on your turf and doing it your way, and we're going we're gonna to debate the way you debate. And I'm just going to come in and just see what the Lord does with it. And he just smashes all of them. Is that not incredible? How God truly makes us great among the nations. In verse 11, the Bible says, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. <coughs> well, doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't this what they did to Jesus? They stirred the crowds to lie about what Jesus was saying and to twist his words. It's so dumb that smart people do that. <laughs> Because in all their wisdom, see, here's, this is a very serious thing. Yeah. The Bible says knowledge puffs up, yet love builds up. And, and so what happens when there's gagusmas? We have become puffed up in our mind. And so we know so much, we've just got to let it on all out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and yet then there's the other who loves God, who loves God's people who looks at them the way God does, everyone is perfect. And that person speaks with a wisdom and a care and a love that builds up the church. And then all the really smart people start talking down about it. And so it says, so they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testify. This fellow never got stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. You know what's funny? Is the religious people always have the same arguments. Those who are religious and don't have the truth have no new arguments. They always have the same complaints, the same arguments, and they have the same lack of power in their lives that draws them to deceit and character assassination rather than just preaching the truth with love. And so, it's the same thing they did. Hold your place. 
What was Stephen saying that made them so upset? Let's take a little prelude here. Let's go to Acts 7, verse 44. Why would these guys attack Stephen so much? <coughs> well, it's an interesting thing. We won't get into it for the sake of time, but what killed all of God's people in the desert? Got goosebumps. Their grumbling and their complaining is what was their downfall in the desert. And so he actually is going to take what happened to all of them and speak to all the Pharisees about it. Verse 44. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under, under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands, as the prophet said. See, they were talking about this temple built by human hands. He's like, the Most High doesn't live in the temple anymore, guys. As the prophet says... Heaven is my throne, and earth, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord. See, he's challenging them. He said, you guys think that this temple right here is still the temple where God lives. He says, no, we're to be building the temple, which is the one that lives inside of all of us. He says, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? You stiff-necked people, he says. Your hearts and ears are always going astray. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Were there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed, and predict, they, they even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that has been going through the angels but have not obeyed it. <laughs> no wonder they're talking badly about him. <laughs> he flat called out their sin. He called out their theological flaws, their misunderstanding of the scriptures, that they asserted that Jesus was not the Messiah. He was not the Christ. And this physical temple was where God resided. Now, we just kind of got to get a picture of how dumb that was to believe that. Okay? So, on the day Jesus was born, I mean, on the day he died, there was this incredible thing that happened at the temple. So Jesus died. There was a massive earthquake. The rocks split. Dead people came out of the ground, started walking around the city preaching. But there was something that happened at the temple that should have made everyone know this was not the temple anymore. The curtain that separated the most holy of holies ripped in two. And there was a big rush out which was the Holy Spirit rushing out of the temple. All those guys stood there. They saw all of it, but they go, no, he's still in there. The, the temple that holds the Holy Spirit in there, the, the curtain that holds him in there is torn in two from top to bottom. It wasn't like just a little tear. And make no mistake what this curtain was like. The curtain was six, six inches thick. It was thicker than this Bible. The temple was pretty tall. And this big old thing just ripped in two from top to bottom. Big gush of... But he's still in there. All the smart people. Can you imagine? Steven, dumb Steven. Guys, let me help you with this. Let me help you with this, all right? So, Jesus told you that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. So, you think the physical thing is the temple. So what kind of church are you going to build? We're building the actual one that lives inside men, that's built as men are added to the kingdom. And didn't you see the? Did you, you see? Did you not see the curtain? Rip? You didn't see that. You you didn't feel like as the spirit rushed out, and you saw it rush into three thousand people on the day of Pentecost. You saw them receive it. You see the miracles they're performing. Can you clearly not see the spirit that was in Jesus is in all of them and all of us by the miracles we're doing? Like, who's the dumb one? I mean, he 
he called it out. And we have got to be those people that boldly proclaim the truth that we have in our church. Amen. And yet, the Bible describes him, as we'll read in just a moment, as having the face of an angel. Well, let's go on back to uh, the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. So, I'm sorry, back to, back to 11. No, no, I, I'm sorry, I left off on, on uh, 14. I, I left up right, right there in 13. It says, they produced false witnesses to testify. This fellow never got stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs while Moses handed down to us. And then it closes out, and it says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that he had the face of an angel. God will take you and transform your heart, transform your life, and give you convictions in such a way that you will preach the truth in a way that cuts through the hearts of all men, and yet they'll see the face of an angel. All those who want to follow God will see the face of an angel. All the rest will want to kill you for it. See, this is the spark of opposition that grew into this final chapter of chapter 7, into the flames of powerful preaching. Let's go there now. Acts chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says, Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to the land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even ground to set his foot on. See, we all want... God to give us everything we think we need before we get about his work. And yet, God wants you to be relying upon him. God wants you to trust in him. God wants you to go in a way that your success shows that he was the one doing the work. We talked about this in staff meeting on Tuesday uh, about God's dream team. And we were talking about the cave of Adullam. Yes. And uh, Cave of Adam was filled with those who were in distress, discontented, and in debt. Come on, Lord. And uh, what a great ministry to start out with. You know, everybody in your Bible talk is in distress, discontented, and broke. It's pretty awesome. And, and yet, we, the way we want things is, um, I, I want like the most fired up people. Oh yeah. I want the guys that just want to preach. And uh, the guys that love sharing their faith, can I have a few of those? And uh, I need a great counselor. So can I have an older Christian that's been around a while who will, uh, like, help everybody? And, and you, you know, the way that we think about things is, can I have everything in such a way that I actually don't really have to do anything? And then that'll be a fired-up group. I'm fired up about that. That's my dream team. And so, and yet we come to find that's not how God wants us to do things. God has a different dream team in mind. See, his dream team is, he gives you like the biggest sinners, the biggest complainers, the people that never read their Bible, the ones that freak out about everything that happens that could be wrong. And, and then he says, I want to give you all those people. Because, because you're going to read your Bible, you're going to stay full of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to let any of this complaining get to you, and you're just going to lead them. And, and one day, they will become the mighty men. See, that's what happened in the cave of Adullam. In the cave of Adullam were the most powerful men in the Old Testament whose acts were not attributed to the Holy Spirit. See, the other people in the, in the Old Testament, every time they did something like phenomenal, it was like the Holy Spirit came on them and they went and did it. But not with David's mighty men. David's mighty men, one dude 
he just killed everybody. It was like, I think it said a thousand men. And his hand froze to his sword. But it didn't say that the Holy Spirit did. This was just a cranking dude. That just had a lot of strength of his own accord. He was actually in the cave. He was one of the whiners, complainers, or guys in debt. Or all of them, maybe. And, and I come to find the ones that do the most powerful things have the most sin. And so he probably complained and was in debt and was very unhappy about things. And God fired him up so much, he goes, guys, I got this. I'm just going to take everybody. Because that's what we do. We, we get so grateful for what God does in our lives. And so... That's the way he sent our, our patriarchs out. That, that's the way he sent the people out in the desert. Is he didn't ha they didn't have food. They gave them all this gold and all these belongings and stuff from the Egyptians. But then he didn't really give them much food. He didn't give them much water. So they were always freaking out that they didn't have what they needed. But yet every time they'd freak out, he'd give it to them. But they wouldn't continue to trust. That's what he was going to do with them. And, and, so, and so we move on here. It says, verse 6, God spoke to him in this way, and for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. He's telling the story of the Israelites. <clears throat> and they will be enslaved and mistreated. Sounds like our old lives, huh? But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. Think about this, guys. Here are patriarchs. They sold their brother. <laughs> That's, see, God takes sinful people and does amazing things with them. But because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and was rescued from all his troubles. See, if you're faithful, if you persevere, if you don't give in to Gakuspas all the time, and you learn what God's teaching you, he will always get you out of your troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. You guys, how does that happen? How does a slave who's in prison, sold into this slavery, come all the way to the place where a king says, you're over at my entire house? That's what God wants to do with your life. Every hardship you're going through right now, every problem that you have, God is forming in you something great to actually share with someone very powerful. And you're going to change their life forever when you're able to overcome what God puts in your life. The Bible says, then a famine struck all Egypt. Do you know why the famine struck? God was making Joseph great. Then a famine struck all of Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. Okay, who's going to find the food? Joseph. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and his ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamar at Shechem for a certain sum of money. At this time... As this, time, as this time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of people, number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. See how that works? Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. See, most people believe in the story of Moses that Pharaoh killed all the babies. Pharaoh didn't just send his men and they stuck him with a spear. Pharaoh actually made his men go make God's people throw their own children over a cliff. He made them kill their own babies. That's how bad things can get in this terrible world. It says at that time, Moses was born. See, God will always send a leader. And he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his family. 
When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and in action. And yet we know Moses to say about himself that he could not speak well. Many of us don't realize how powerful God has made us. God's given you great education, great job. There's a difference between having a great education and not really loving the Lord and having a great education and loving the Lord and wanting to do his will. Those are the special ones God does, like things that we can't even fathom. That was the Paul's. See, Paul was very well educated. The other guys were dumb. Paul was really smart. Okay? And that's why he became the greatest of the apostles. Because God has a special role for him. And, and yet right here we come to find Moses is powerful in speech, doesn't think of himself that, that way. It says when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went outside. He went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. There's going to come a point in your life where you look at the people who God's let you grow up with, the people in your family, and you're going to see how terrible Satan is attacking them. And you're finally going to really care to the point that you'll give your life for it. That's when God can use you power. And I want you to think, maybe today is that day for you, that you remember all the terrible things that God let you go through growing up. You look back and you see your family still in the middle of it. You see them suffering. You see them not turning to the Lord. And today is a day that you can let that well up in your heart. Today is your day to go avenge them. Today is your day to go find them and to help them find a relationship with God. It says Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. See, isn't that the challenge, Bible talk leaders? When you feel that the people in your group aren't hearing you. When you feel that they're not following you. You go, okay, God, you told me to come to Bible Talk Leaders meeting. You said God would use me, but they don't listen. Well, they didn't listen to Moses either. I guess we found one that feels that way. And yet, and yet, that is the journey of leadership. It's we've got to be able to lead those who do well and those who do not. Those that are very obedient and those that are not obedient. Those that really want to be with you and those that really don't want to be with you. You, 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 We have to love everybody exactly the same. Because God eventually moves every person's heart. The greater the challenge, the bigger the miracle when it changes. So do not give up. Verse 27, we'll move on from there. But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Isn't it funny how we question people who God puts in our life? Uh, God chose me. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Moses is like, I wouldn't have chose me, but God is the one that chose him. But we get in that mindset like, oh, well, who picked him to be the Bible talk leader? He's not very good. Who picked that person to lead me? And yet, it's God. It's kind of like a marriage, right? So it was awesome. You know, Omar and Ashley are back from their honeymoon. They got married a few weeks ago. That's really great. And, uh, and Andreas and Bridget are about to get married. And, and that's awesome. And, you know, we do this marriage counseling thing because there will come a day when the honeymoon phase is over. And then you got to really be able to work through things, you know. And, uh, and so and, and at that point you go, Many in, in this world, people decide that that person's not from God that I married. Yeah. I'm divorcing them. I'm getting rid of them. And yet, how do we know that it's from God? Because he let it happen. Yes. That's how. So often, we want the Lord to like personally come down and speak to us and say, hey, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing with you. And, and yet, he's never going to do that. He's never just going to march on down and, okay, let me write it down for you so you know it's from me. He did that right here. He did that right here. And yet, how do you know that your husband or your wife is from God? That he picked the right one? Well, because he let you get married to him. It's 
It's really as simple as that. You look down and you go, yep, that ring made it on my finger. God could have stopped it, but he didn't. And yet, why did I have the Bible talk leader I have? Ah, because they're the Bible talk leader. That's why. Why do I have this church leader that I have now? I like the other one better. Because God did it. I don't know why. I wouldn't have picked me either, just like Moses. But he picked me. You know? But, you know, it's not a personal thing with me. Because that happens to every preacher when every preacher goes into a church. Corey's gone to Chicago, and I guarantee you, there's people there like, I would re- really would rather have Mike Underhill back. Now, not m- most of them are not like that, and most disciples are not like that. But that's human nature, guys. That's part of the, that's part of the, that's part of the territory. That's what happens. But that's the opportunity to connect. That's the opportunity to pull close and show the power of God that exists in our lives. Instead of pulling away, we pull closer together. Amen? So he goes on here, and he says, verse 30, After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush. That would freak me out. In the desert near Mount Sinai. It must have been one of those forest fires. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the impression of my people Egypt. I've heard their groaning. I have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. And we know the rest of the story with Moses. I read all of this for one main purpose. This was an average, ordinary, unschooled, dumb guy. And he remembered all of this. He didn't have one of these, so he had notes. He was preaching from the heart. Seeing the suffering of his people made him memorize God's word. Made him memorize the stories of his people. Made him dig on in so that he could preach about it powerfully to this lost world. And especially get the priests and the people who are smarter than him. So that God's power would be seen in the actions of his life. See, the sparks of grumbling bring great preaching and great teaching. The sparks of opposition bring the flames of powerful preaching in men who would otherwise not be so powerful. Wow. Can you imagine what the other disciples were thinking hearing Stephen. They're like, dude, that was Stephen. Like, whoa, that dude is cranking. Where'd that come from? You didn't do that last year. Whoa. And yet they looked and they saw the face of an angel. See, what they saw is the Holy Spirit welling up in a man in deep conviction to save this world. You know, You have a powerful sermon sitting inside of you. Every one of you. Whether you're doing well, not doing well, it has no bearing. You have a powerful sermon. See, you've seen things. You've experienced things. And you've had God touch you in ways that other people cannot even fathom. And yet today, I want to call you to preach that sermon to this lost world. Can I get an amen from the church? See, some of you are waiting for me to call you to come on up here and preach. And that will happen one day for many of you. And yet, it won't happen up here if you don't go preach it now. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think of Mason Fedelika. You know, Mason's become one of my dearest friends. And I appreciate him as our new associate minister here in Southwest. He comes here early and serves just like, just like Matt. You think about the two other guys that are on staff with us here. They come early. No one told them to. No one asked them to. They just came of their own accord. Because that's how you actually become a minister. God sets it on your heart to just give of yourself. And, and let me tell you, Mason is a preacher. Mason can preach this place crazy. I mean, we had, a, we had a house church service a couple weeks ago. 
And Mason just flat preached the word, the purposes of God. And my wife is funny. My wife has always told me that I'm like her favorite preacher. And that's, that's pretty cool. I, I appreciate that, honey. She's a little biased. But. but she came home because I was up preaching for the central region because Mike and Brittany Underhill had their baby. And I came home and she was like, hey, Mason flat preached the word. She's like, oh, my gosh. She's like, you're still my favorite preacher, but Mason is, like, right there. Like, it was flat awesome. And I just want to encourage you. Any one of you can flat preach awesome. You just have to dig deep into what God has done with you. Dig deep into the scriptures and just let loose like never before. Don't be afraid of mistakes. We all make them. Just preach the word with all of your heart, and God will cover all those mistakes like he covers over our sins in the church. Today, don't give in to the spark of grumbling. Give in to the spark of great preaching. Well up these flames for God in our communities. I mean, you look around, you read the news, you see it. They need you. Your family needs you. All these people getting shot need you. They needed you before they got shot. Yeah. And, you know, there's riots all over the place. Our world needs each and every one of you, every single one of us, to get up, to preach the sermon that's sitting inside of you, and to fan that into powerful, incredible conversions like what we've seen. It was incredible to see Louie baptized today. It was incredible to see Kiki. It was phenomenal to see T.O. get baptized a couple of weeks ago. Let's continue. Let's continue to find these people. And next week, we'll finish fire of uh, spark. <laughs> we'll finish this, this lesson of a fire from a spark. And we'll do part two next week. I love you guys. Have an incredible day today.